A School of Her Own by Arletta Richardson Chapter 10 Something to Think About For several days, the children had been playing Pilgrims and Indians during recess time. Did you ever see a pilgrim, Miss Odell? Teddy Sawyer asked me. No, but I saw an Indian when I was just a little girl, I replied. Did you really? Edward joined in. What did he look like? Were you scared? I told them about the Indian who had visited our cabin and left a beaded basket in exchange for food. Toby Elliot looked apprehensively toward the woods. I don't suppose there are any more left back there. No, I assured him. We aren't likely to have Indian visitors now, and if we did, they'd all be friendly, I'm sure. I'd like to see some. I wouldn't be scared. Toby spoke bravely now that there appeared to be no danger from the woods. The pilgrims owed their lives to God and the Indians the first year they were here, I said. That's why they had a Thanksgiving feast and invited their Indian friends. And that's why we still have Thanksgiving every year, Hannah put in. Don't know why we have to thank God for our crops, Abe Lawton said. Seems to me we work hard enough to raise them. You could work twice as hard and have nothing if God didn't send the rain and the sun, I said. Don't you think God deserves some thanks for the strength we have to work? My pa don't depend on God and we got the same sun and rain everyone else has, Abe muttered. That's true, I agreed. The Bible says that very thing. God doesn't demand praise from his children, but it pleases him when they remember to give it. Aren't you glad that we have a Heavenly Father who loves us even when we forget him? The other children nodded solemnly while Abe stared rebelliously at his desk. My heart ached for him. If his only understanding of a Heavenly Father came from his experience with his earthly one, it was small wonder that he felt as he did. Mr. Clark and Sarah Jane arrived on Wednesday afternoon before Thanksgiving in a flurry of snow. I was packed and ready to go. Four whole days at home, I exclaimed as we drove off. You can't believe how I've looked forward to this. Oh, yes, I can, Sarah Jane said. You're not the only one who's going to enjoy having no lessons and no children. I won't even think about school until next Sunday afternoon. Will your family all be home tomorrow? I nodded. I'm going to see my nephew for the first time. Reuben is so proud of that boy that he's written twice to tell me how big he's getting. I can't remember Reuben ever writing to me before. Our family will all be home too. I'll come over after dinner to see the new baby and catch up on the past few weeks. We rode on in silence for a moment. Then she continued. So... How's your friend Elizabeth? Elizabeth who? I'm glad to see you've resolved your differences. There are no differences to resolve, I stated. She goes her way and I go mine. If that's the kind of girl Len wants, he's welcome to her. Sarah Jane wisely decided not to pursue that line of conversation, and we talked about other things the rest of the way home. Russ was due to arrive on Friday after Thanksgiving. I was sure he wouldn't waste much time visiting with Warren's family before he headed for our house. He appeared at the door shortly after dinner. Ma greeted him warmly and called to me. Mabel, Russ is here. I surveyed myself in the mirror and tucked a stray curl back into place. I was truly glad to see Russ. Why wasn't I more excited? Hello, Mabel. It's good to see you, he said stiffly as I entered the room. You're looking well. I am well, thank you, I replied. Did you have a good trip over? Yes, very good. He looked nervously around the room. Say, would you like to go for a walk? It isn't snowing very hard. That would be nice, I said. I'll get my coat. In my mind, I could hear Sarah Jane's mocking voice. You're certainly off to a galloping start. I smiled. Not everyone jumps into the middle of things the way you do, my girl. I answered silently. Once outside, Russ turned to me eagerly. 
I thought the time would never pass until I could see you, he exclaimed. I enjoyed your letters, but it's just not the same as being with you. Have you thought about what I mentioned that we need to talk about? Our future? I nodded. Yes, I've thought about it. Good. Then it's all settled. We'll be married as soon as I finish school. I stopped and looked at him in amazement. What happened to talking about it? I asked. Oh, we will, he replied happily. You know I'll be going into the bank with my father when I graduate. <clears throat> He'll build us a house and you can decorate it any way you like. We'll have a good life, Mabel. You'll never lack for anything. Russ looked so pleased that I hated to burst his bubble. I haven't said that I'd marry you yet, I told him gently. In fact, I don't believe you even asked me to. He looked perplexed. But you knew. What else did you think I had in mind for our future? You do want to marry me, don't you? I don't know, Russ. It's a big decision to make, and I feel I should pray about it. I want to be sure it's the Lord's will for my life. I've prayed about it, and I'm sure, Russ said. I never had any idea of marrying anyone else. A thought suddenly occurred to him. Have you met another fellow? Has he asked for your hand? Of course not, Russ, I laughed. I'd let you know if I were spoken for. It's just that we still have three and a half years to plan our lives. I think we should be friends now and talk about marriage later. You may find someone in Ann Arbor that you like better, you know. Never. He shook his head decisively. My mind is made up. If I can't have you, I won't have anyone. Not even Clarice Owens, I teased him. That doesn't even deserve an answer. I'm sorry, that wasn't nice. But you're getting too serious, Russ. Come on, let's race to the gate. We ran down the lane and leaned against the fence to get our breath. The mood was broken, and we spent the rest of the afternoon talking happily about school. May I still write to you? Russ asked me as he prepared to leave. Will you write to me? Certainly. I'm always happy to hear from you. And Russ... Thank you for asking me. I do like you very much, and I'll think about it. That's a nice young man, Ma said as we put supper on the table. You need another daughter, Ma. One who could make up her mind before she turned into a spinster. I'm not worried about it, Ma replied. As long as you follow God's timetable for your life, you can't go wrong. Sarah Jane was philosophical about the matter. I guess you know what you're doing, Mabel. If Thomas asks me to marry him in three years, I'll say yes immediately and then think on it. You know about a bird in the hand being worth two in the bush. Not if the one in the bush looks better than the one in your hand, I retorted. I do like Russ, and common sense tells me that I could never have a better man in a lot of ways. So, what are you waiting for? I don't know, I replied. I really don't know. The time between Thanksgiving and Christmas went swiftly. There were so many activities to plan, along with the regular daily work, that I had no time to dwell on my personal problems. Miss O'Dell, we have a new girl in school today. Nancy Lawton met me at the door with the exciting news. And she's just our size, she added with delight. I watched as Josie and Rosie escorted a dark-eyed child to the porch. She was poorly dressed by the standards of the community, wearing only a sweater over her pinafore. Instead of a warm hat, a scarf was over her head, the ends of which were wound around her neck and descended to the hem of her dress. She had no mittens, and her hands were blue with cold. "'Come inside and stand by the stove,' I said. "'Have you just moved here?' She nodded. "'What is your name?' I asked as I rubbed her hands. Mary Ann, she replied softly. That's a pretty name, I smiled at her. That's my mother's name, too. What is your last name? Romani. Romani? Why did that name sound familiar? I couldn't think why it should nudge something in my memory, so I left Mary Ann sitting by the stove and I went to call the rest of the children in. 
When they were all settled with their lessons, I turned my attention to her again. Have you been in school before? I asked. No, ma'am. Where do you live? She pointed vaguely toward the east. I think she lives out back of the Abbott's pasture, Miss O'Dell, George Elliot volunteered, in a wagon. Teddy snickered and I glanced at him sharply. A wagon? My mind went back swiftly to the gypsy family who had stayed on our farm for a week, five years previously. Could this be the same Romani family? The little girl was the right age, and Mrs. Romani could have renamed the baby after Ma when they left. I determined to walk over after school and see. In the meantime, I placed Mary Ann with the other beginners, and they were kept busy showing her what they knew. At dismissal time, Carrie, Elsie, and Prudence wanted me to hear the skit they had been preparing for the Christmas program. This will use everyone in school, even the beginners, Carrie said. Do you think it will be all right? It's fine, I told them. We'll begin practicing tomorrow. With the recitations and songs we have, it should be an excellent program. Are you ready to leave, Miss O'Dell? Elsie asked me. Yes, but I'm going to walk over to the Abbots for a few minutes. I replied. You go ahead, Elsie. I'll see you in the morning. I locked the big front door and made my way to the abbot's pasture. Sure enough, there sat the gypsy wagon that Sarah Jane and I had seen that long ago summer. As I approached, a woman, whom I recognized as Mrs. Romani, came to meet me. Hello, Mrs. Romani. I'm Mabel O'Dell. Do you remember me? The look of surprise turned to a bright smile and she clasped my hand. Of course, and you live here now? I nodded. I'm the school teacher. When Marianne came today, I recognized the name. I hoped it might be you. Mrs. Romani's smile faded. But where is Marianne? She said. Why, isn't she here? No, she has not come from school. Did she not leave with you? The smaller children left some time before I did, I answered. She must have come home with the twins. Come on, we'll go to the house and get her. But the Abbott children hadn't seen her. She didn't come with us. We thought she ran on ahead. Panic showed in Mrs. Romani's face and I sought to calm her. We'll go back to school. She must be somewhere along the way. There's no place to get off the road between here and there. The road was empty and there was no sign of a small girl in a sweater and a shawl. We searched around the school grounds carefully. Mrs. Romani growing more and more frantic as the moments passed. Let's look inside, I said as I unlocked the door, though I'm sure there was no one here when I left. The room appeared to be empty, but I walked to the front and looked behind my desk. A small sound turned my attention to the big stove in the corner. There lay Marianne Romani, sleeping soundly on a bench along the wall. Here she is, I called and Mrs. Romani snatched the little girl up and held her closely. I thank the Lord that he led me to go and see whether they were the gypsies I knew, I said to Alice and Mrs. Williams later. That poor child would have been so frightened to awaken in an empty room. She probably would not have come back to school. Some people would say it was a coincidence, Alice remarked. But I believe the Lord directs us, and there's nothing too small for his attention. I agreed and thought how blessed I was to be able to leave my life in his hands, too. End of chapter 10